I'm Corey Johnson, in for Emily Chang, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Well, incredible but true, more legal problems at Uber, including a criminal investigation and two previously undisclosed pros by the Justice Department. Plus, exploding tech scene in Seattle with Amazon and Microsoft taking the lead. We're going to hear from top executives at each firm, all from our continuing coverage of the GeekWire Summit. And Japanese billionaire and SoftBank founder Matsuyoshi Sun, his take on the early meeting that gave him his first break and how he closed the investment of a lifetime with Jack Ma. But first to our lead, the continuing saga of Uber's legal troubles, the company facing two additional criminal investigations. There are now five ongoing probes in the world's most valuable startup. Uber Technologies' Eric Newcomer, who uncovered this scoop, joins us now. I mean... <laughs> Yeah. When I saw the notes uh, this morning, emails this morning, I'm like, really? Yeah. Haven't we done this story? Right. I've got to think the legal department, Uber, is feeling the same way. Well, I mean, I think they're in for a long haul here. I mean, it takes a, a long time for these things to wind their way through. We knew about three criminal f probes before. We're reporting two new ones. So we're now up to five separate areas of investigation that the U.S. Justice Department is looking at Uber These are for. all federal. Yes, yeah. These are Why are there five? Why isn't there one big one? <laughs> well, uh, there are five areas of focus, right? I mean, there are different sort of units within the Justice Department that might be looking at different parts of it. But sort of very quickly, you know, we've got bribery, which is FCPA. We have... Uh, Foreign Corrupt uh, Practices Act. Yes. yes sorry. <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Big fancy acronyms. Right, exactly. The rest are not. We've got the one rooted in the Waymo fight, the legal fight with Alphabet self-driving car, right. and how they obtain sort of and whether they obtain trade secrets there. We've got sort of pricing, you know, we've got... That's the, that's the pricing that being, the, is that, that's the hell software program? No, so pricing we know sort of the least about what specifically, but Uber basically separated what it charges us consumers and what it pays drivers and there are a lot of questions around how right. it did that and how it calculates price and how transparent So they might charge you and me different prices to go to the same place at the same time? Because uh, you're loaded and I'm not. They say they don't do that, but there are lots of questions about how they do pricing. Um, and those are under investigation. And then Hell and Grayball are the remaining two, which are both software programs. Hell, uh, Gray Grayball is a way to keep uh, people who might investigate them from getting Ubers at all, right? Exactly. And Hell? What did, yeah, you're Uber trivia. Uh, define hell. hell was learning about competitors. So scraping right. competitor, in this case, Lyft's API, their public data and seeing uh, you know, where drivers were and learning about them. The question there is, you're not really allowed to violate a competitor's terms of service when you agree to scrape the data. The general understanding is that you're gonna follow the rules they give you about it, and Uber might not have. And so which two pieces are new here? The new ones, uh, Waymo going criminal, and then the fact that pricing is under a criminal probe as well. Now, the, the suit between Waymo, which is part of Google, right. and, and Uber uh, is, is imminent, right? It's, right. it's just about December. to take place. Yeah. There was a, a delay when some new information came out, when, we, when the, their, their internal investigation at Uber became part of the record, exactly. and that has paused the trial. What is the effect of a criminal investigation on the trial that's just about right. to happen? There's a risk that it could slow it down. If people start getting subpoenaed or are worried that they're going to have to plead the fifth, then it's pen possible that it slows it down. I think it would really depend on Uber's desire to do so. And so far, I think they've wanted to move along and get this resolved. So as, as far it's as I- interesting though, because having a new CEO and possibly a new philosophy from many new board members might completely change the way they want to fight about against right. these things or For deal sure. with these things. Yeah. It's not just the sins of the past. I mean, the, the old Uber might be very different than the new Uber. Right. There's a big question of how much they're trying to defend past behavior versus saying we've reformed and have, you know, separated with our old CEO, we're changing our general counsel, you know, uh, we fired a number of people after a holder's investigation, you know. I think that question, whether they're positioning themselves as a new company or the same old company defending itself, is an open question on some of these on these probes. Eric Newcomer, thank you very much. Eric Newcomer, thank Bloomberg News much. came all the way across the news. Yeah, so far, trekked way over here. Twice, once on radio today, too. Thank you for that, too. Yep. 
All right, now more coverage from the Geek Wire Summit in Seattle. The biggest players in the area, Amazon and Microsoft, reviewing their efforts to improve diversity within their ranks. So Sue Kinderson Cassidy, the Boardless co founder, uh, joins us. Her company connects boards and qualified female candidates. She was once a, a president of Google's Asia Pacific and Latin America operations and a former executive of Amazon. Uh, Sue Kinder, uh, good to see you as always. See you there. Tell me what you're doing at GeekWire in Seattle. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm here talking about my favorite topic these days, diversity in tech and corporate governance. And boy, are they intersecting right now. Yeah, so uh, uh, what's the audience uh, in terms of, of that message? And, and what, what's new in that conversation? In terms of, I think, what's new in the board of directors conversation, I think we just need to look back to the last nine months, even here in the Valley, um, and of course we can look to Hollywood right now for uh, much of the same unfortunate news, which is, you know, boards of directors being surprised by allegations against the CEO, which brings in, in this case, you know, sexual harassment or sexual misconduct allegations. And so I think what we're really learning is that corporate governance is behind in the Valley, and particularly behind when it comes to matters of gender. Yeah, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of surprise as it relates to Hollywood. Uh, but, you know, as it relates to Silicon Valley, uh, I, you know, I, this, this horrible behavior by, by some individuals is kind of an amazing thing. But when I think of it from an investment standpoint, you know, we know that companies that have diverse boards and diverse leadership outperform as investments. Uh, is, uh, what message, I would think that's a very convincing message to give to boards because uh, uh, they want their stocks to do better because investors want them to do better. Uh, but for you, when you're, when you're meeting with these executives and meeting with these boards, what message sort of wins the, the discussion? Because no one's against this. You know, it, yeah, it's, yeah, of course, no one's against it, so we all wonder why it doesn't happen faster. I mean, I spend the vast majority of my time actually talking to private company CEOs far more than public companies because I think the opportunity for private company CEOs is obviously to use diverse thinkings to kind of change the trajectory of their companies, right? Most of them have very financially uh, driven boards, uh, driven by venture capitalists, which on the one hand brings one perspective, but it lacks the operator perspective. It lacks having a peer in the room. It lacks having the expertise you need in the room in areas around customer engagement or acquisition or in culture or uh, who your customer is. These are all perspectives that are missing from the boardroom that could significantly change the probabilities of success for a founder. So those are the arguments that actually hold the most weight, which is an independent board and a board that brings extra expertise that quite frankly you don't have in the company gives you a better chance of winning the day. And at the end of the day, that's what founders care about. So Amazon, uh, an infamously difficult place to work. You worked there for a while. How is Amazon doing in terms of uh, diversity? You know, I think, it's a, I think it's a great question. Look, I think it's no surprise that if you survey all the tech companies, the large ones, you know, whether you're talking about the big four or the big five, all of them have their diversity challenges, and I think they've been transparent in actually sharing that data. You know, what I think is probably more encouraging than not is that they are all actually sharing that data, which we don't see in private company, board, uh, in private company dynamics, and, and that's part of the problem. There's a lack of transparency in what's going on in smaller companies. And at the larger ones, look, I think this is going to be a multi-year battle at Amazon included uh, in order to get a gender equal and a diverse set of talent to the table on every job and in every role and at every level. So I think Amazon is not faring any better or worse than Google or Facebook in this regard as far as I can tell, uh, but recognizes this is a multi-year challenge. Do the headlines uh, of, of uh, uh, Weinstein and, and the Weinstein Company and Harvey Weinstein, does that kind of thing help uh, uh, the cause? Uh, for sure. Look, I mean, you know, as much as we look at the board list as a positive force, and we think we have been a positive force in the industry and one that's very solution-oriented, I don't think that anybody can take away from, you know, the power of repercussions uh, in the negative sense. And I think the Harvey Weinstein case in some ways just reinforces much of the same um, bad behavior we've seen at certain companies and the repercussions for the CEO or for the investors or the board members for not being aware. So um, although it's a negative case, and it's uh, unfortunate that that's what it takes to bring attention to the issue. I think whenever there is real loss, and we've seen it here in the Valley, of power or status or money, um, you know, people uh, finally take action. So uh, to answer your question, yeah, you know, what's happening with Harvey Weinstein, it does help the cause, even if it's an unfortunate case. Yeah, Sue Kinderson Cassidy, thanks a lot. We appreciate it. Sue Kinderson Cassidy of the board list.
Well, coming up, the SoftBank CEO Masayoshi Son tells the story of his most profitable investment of his career. And Bloomberg Technology live streaming on Twitter right now. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV on weekdays, 5 o'clock on the East Coast, 2 o'clock on the West Coast. This is Bloomberg. Story we've been watching, Qualcomm fined a record $773 million by Taiwan's Fair Trade Commission. The reason? Violating antitrust rules for at least seven years and collecting licensing fees from local companies during that time. Qualcomm disagrees with the decision and intends to appeal. Now, SoftWing founder Masayoshi Son invested in more than 1,000 companies, but one investment looms above all, an early bet on Alibaba. Son talked about the deal on the David Rubenstein Show, Peer-to-Peer -peer Conversations. One of the investments you made is considered by many people to be the most successful investment in the history of mankind. You invested roughly $20 million in Alibaba, and at the time it went public, it was worth roughly $90 billion. So $20 million to $90 billion is a return of about 4,500%. Now, Jack Ma is a very distinguished individual now, now one of the most successful entrepreneurs in the world. What is it that made you feel this was worth putting in $20 million? Well, he had no business plan <laughs> and uh, zero revenue. Uh, employees, maybe 35, 40 employees. But his eyes was very strong, strong eyes, strong, shining eyes. Um, I could tell from the way he talked, the way he looked at, he has a charisma, he has a leadership. So his business model was wrong. It's the way he talked, the way you know, he can bring you know, young uh, Chinese people f following him. Before Yahoo was so famous, you made an early investment in it, which was spectacularly successful. How did you hear of Yahoo? Yeah, Yahoo US was still private, 15 employees. And I convinced Jerry Yan to take $100 million of our investment. So at the time we negotiated, we agreed they grew from 15 to 35 people, 30, 35 people. And we invest $100 million to own 35%. And actually went IPO and made a great return. And at the same time, I convinced him to start joint venture, board of Jiafu uh, Japan, where we put $1.2 million they put $0.8 million, $2 million startup capital. We own 60%. Now, let's talk about one big mistake you made overall. And you're obviously, you're very successful in almost everything you've touched. But you were making a lot of internet investments around the turn of the century, around year 2000, 1999, 2001. The market went down in the, in the, in the tech crash. And it is said that you personally lost $70 billion of net worth the greatest loss that any human being has ever suffered financially. So how did you feel losing $70 billion of net worth? One year before that, actually, my net worth, personal net worth was increasing $10 billion per week. <laughs> For three days, I became richer than Bill Gates. Well, was, did that upset him or? No, before I told to anybody else, you know, our stock started okay. crashing. Okay. <laughs> uh, so in, in uh, six months after that, our share price went down 99%. So we, we all almost went bankrupt. And somehow I survived. That's great stuff. All right, you can watch more of that interview with SoftBank's Masayoshi Son on the David Rubenstein Show, Peer to Peer Conversations at Bloomberg.com. Well, coming up, we're talking startups, we're talking Seattle, we're talking cats, we're talking dogs, we're talking to the founder, Seattle based Rover. Next, this is Bloomberg.
Well, the Seattle tech scene isn't all about Amazon, Microsoft, and VMware. Seattle's also home to an active startup scene. Turn right now from the GeekWire Summit in Seattle is Pioneer Labs co-founder and Rover founder, Greg Gottesman. Greg, uh, glad to have you on. Um, how would you characterize this? And I want to get to lots of cats and dogs questions, I promise. But how would you characterize the, the startup scene in, in Seattle? What drives it? I think, uh, first of all, great to, great to be with you. Uh, the startup scene in Seattle, I think, is really driven by engineers. Uh, one of the things that Seattle, thanks to the University of Washington, Amazon, Microsoft, has is an incredible uh, engineering, uh, just backbone, incredible engineering talent, most of which has been imported here. And so we really benefit from engineering talent, which I think, and a lot of people think, is the heart of most you know, great technology startups. Uh, so, so really sort of focused on the, the, the geeked out part of it, the what's technologically possible as opposed to say a marketing focus uh, a la Steve Jobs or a product focus? Well, I, I definitely think we have, you know, one of the things that we're lucky to have is just really strong technology folks. And so where compared to say Silicon Valley, uh, we're, you know, we have a lot of strength is in engineering and uh, sort of the, a lot of the hard science around uh, you know, big data, machine learning, artificial intelligence, uh, cloud computing, those are really areas of strength for Seattle uh, versus anywhere else in the world. And so um, you'll see a lot of great companies in those areas come from here, as well as other companies like uh, e-commerce that grows well here, uh, mobile grows well here. So we have certain areas of strength, but Engineering in particular, one of the things to note is Facebook and Google and a lot of the large technology companies have opened their, their second largest, uh, other than Silicon Valley, uh, engineering hubs here in Seattle. And so we really benefit from that in the startup world as well. Some of those people eventually fall in love with the city, want to start a company, and then those of us in, venture, in the venture area can take advantage of some of those great folks that are, uh, you know, that come from the Amazons, the, the Microsofts, the Facebooks, the Googles, and right. ultimately want to go and, and start a company, yeah. And my, and my friends at Amazon tell me they don't do any recruiting in February. They make sure they're doing it when it's still sunny and wonderful there, <laughs> as it is most of the year in Seattle. Well, um, so, but to yeah. that, so tell me about Rover. Yeah. Well, Rover is the world's largest uh, dog, uh, you know, dog sitting, dog walking, overnight care uh, company in the world. It, it's uh, we've got uh, you know hundreds of thousands of customers and and uh, and uh, you know tens of thousands of incredible sitters. And and it was an idea that really stemmed from an issue I had at a kennel where we took our dog there. We didn't, you know, my parents were out of town and I couldn't find someone to watch our dog and uh, took the dog to a, to a kennel and it was one of the worst experiences I've ever had. And I thought, you know, someone could do this better. Maybe someone down the street uh, who wanted to make a little extra money, who would love our dog as much as we would. And, and that was sort of the birth of, of Rover and it's turned into something really special. Uh, well, tell me about that. So, so basically, the Uber of dog sitters, right? So, uh, and you feel free to correct me, but uh, how has the business grown? How big is it? And why is it important that it started in Seattle, if it is at all? Uh, wait, so, it, so it's across the United States. Every, every city of any size has rover sitters and dog walkers. Um, it's in the hundreds of millions of dollars, and, and it's, a, you know, it's a real uh, business. It turns out one of the nice things about this business is if you're going out of town, uh, it's not a nice to have to have someone watch your dog. Someone needs to watch your dog. And Rover is a, is a superior, less expensive, and just a better all around solution for, for people that really love their, their pets. And so that's, I think, why it's really caught on. Um, the other reason it's grown so well is it has an incredible team uh, of dog, you know, people that are passionate about dogs and, and uh, they've really done an incredible job of executing uh, on this vision of, of that every dog, you know, every, every person should be able to have and experience the love of a dog. And I, you know, for those of us who have dogs, you know, I have older kids now. They're not the ones greeting me at the door anymore. It's, uh, it's typically a Jordy that comes running up and is licking me on my face. So that, you know, everyone should have that experience <laughs> if they can. You know, not every startup provides the, uh, the added benefit of getting licked on the face. So that's, that's probably maybe only appropriate in your startups. <laughs> that, that's great stuff. And I really yes, hope my kids are watching are a few this. Yes, startups, yeah. 
Well, you're going to ruin my, you know, my, my, yeah. my last of my excuses by kids about why I don't get a dog. So I'm, I'm really hoping they're not watching Bloomberg TV right now. Oh, uh, we great make it stuff. really easy. Yeah, your kids. Yeah, your kids no, should definitely no, get on No, no, don't about tell that. them that. You're not helping the argument. Greg, <laughs> thank you. Greg Gottesman, you've done yes. enough. Yes. Pioneer Square Labs, uh, Greg Gottesman, also the founder of Rover. Thanks a lot. We appreciate it. All right, well, coming up, Microsoft is taking on Amazon Web Services head on. We're going to look at their latest moves and their uh, uh, ways they're going after the big cloud business and Amazon Web Services. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. Indeed, check out Bloomberg Markets with me and Carol Masser on the radio every day. We're in Washington, New York, Boston, and the Bay Area on the radio, on terrestrial radio. Also on the Bloomberg Radio app. Also on Bloomberg.com. Also in the U.S. on Sirius XM Channel 119. That's Bloomberg Radio. And this is Bloomberg. Technology. I'm Corey Johnson, in for Emily Chang. We'll all week long, we've been bringing you guests from the Geek Wire Summit in Seattle. Emily Chang sat down with Microsoft's Chief Digital Officer, Kurt Del Bene, to talk about Microsoft's battle with Amazon for cloud computing supremacy. Well, I actually think our offering is super strong across the board, whether you start at the Azure layer, you think about our differentiation in terms of having a hybrid approach, where you can transition to the cloud as you want to transition, but have on-premises capabilities as well. And then we're working at all levels in the stack, whether it's at the OS level, it's at the database level, it's things like AI on top, and helping people at all levels, productivity, figuring out how Office 365 integrates in with our Azure offering. I think what we're starting to hear more and more from customers is they're thinking about, one, the relationship they have with Microsoft and that whole broad suite of capabilities that they can go get by going to Azure. I'm curious how you see, you know, the, the, the pie being divided differently in the future. I mean, how do you avoid Amazon becoming the default choice for customers? Well, I think we're doing very well in the market right now, and so I think what you're seeing playing out is there's not gonna be a default choice per se, that people are gonna look at that and what the particular opportunities are for the particular workloads they'll move, what the value proposition is for us versus Amazon versus others. I don't think we're gonna get to a place where any one vendor is that default choice. I think you're gonna have strength in the market with with the people that seem to be emerging now. What are some areas that you think Azure will be bigger and faster in, in the future than Amazon and the other players? I think we will be stronger in terms of our hybrid capabilities. I think in terms of our database offerings, that in terms of, think of all the people who use SQL on-premises today mm -hmm. and some of the announcements we've made, both in terms of being able to surge to the cloud in terms of your database capabilities, but also a, a easy, super easy movement to the cloud. Um, so at the database layer, I think we'll be stronger. I think our AI capabilities will, and our cognitive services, so that value added um, as an applications environment, but also when you think about all the data that's in Office 365, all the productivity data, who I'm meeting with, who I'm talking to, how do I as um, either a third party developer or as you know, somebody who uses Office 365 leverage that data to build rich, interesting applications as well. I did a panel with three investors on stage and they all said they think AR and VR is overhyped, that it's not growing as big and as fast as people thought. These are two big areas that Microsoft mm -hmm. is putting a bet on. Absolutely. How do you respond to that? Do you think it's overhyped? I think that it is going to emerge over a period of time. I think we're seeing some early wins, particularly in the industrial space of people using HoloLens. I think we're seeing a lot of developer interest in um, the capabilities we're build building into Windows. But I think there, in any of these technologies, there's that period where there's a lot of hype coming in, and then there's a building of the actual use cases and a building of excitement. And I, I think there's no doubt that there's that building period that we're in today. I think it's also a great opportunity for us because if you believe in the vision and you believe that that's important over the long run, those are the periods of time where you say, I'm doubling down, I'm, I'm gonna be really strong in this area, and it gives you that time to build a super rich offering. So when do you think mixed reality will be everyone's reality, or will well, it? I think mixed reality, I think you will start to see augmentation of your reality in the next several years. Mm -hmm. I think you'll be cases like HoloLens, but also just the ability, like, uh, there's a bunch of focus around this notion that you can show what's going, you, 
put your phone up and see um, the combination of a scene that really exists in front of you with an augmentation, I think those kinds of scenarios are going to emerge very soon. President Obama asked you to oversee healthcare.gov and the rollout of that. What's it like watching all of the efforts that the Trump administration is taking to roll that back? It's, on a personal level, it's very difficult to watch. Um, again, on a personal basis, I believe that people have a right to health care, um, to affordable health care. I think the actual Obamacare or the ACA is a strong foundation for building that um, capabil capability to deliver health care to all citizens of the United States. So, again, this is a personal point of view. It's hard for me to watch. Um, before you ran healthcare.gov, you ran Microsoft Office. Yes. And I'm curious how you think productivity is going to be different in the next, let's say, one to five years. How will the way I work change? Well, I think in a lot of ways it'll change by everything just being a lot, lot more seamless and easier to do. So, for instance, think about how Teams work. We've done a lot with Microsoft Teams to say there's so many different channels in the way you communicate, but a team acts as a single unit. And so how do you bring everything together, where, whether I'm chatting with somebody, doing email, whether I'm collaborating in a document, bring all that together into one place for the very first time, really, um, I think is a huge opportunity. I've worked in collaboration for so long and it's always been where well, we've got this offering and this offering, but how do they really finally come together? I think you're going to find that place where people intuitively come to a single a team site and all the different ways that they want to communicate and work together are just there. That's cool. Microsoft Chief Digital Officer Kurt Delbeni and Emily Chang from Bloomberg joins me now live from the Geekware Summit in Seattle. So how's it been? How's Seattle? Hey, Corey, thanks so much. Seattle's fun. Seattle is, look, it's the second biggest tech hub in the country. They are very proud of that for a long time. It was really a two-horse area. We'll say area because Microsoft is actually in Bellevue, adjacent to Seattle. Uh, but, you know, beyond Amazon and Microsoft, you've got Facebook and Google and Alibaba and even Baidu opening offices here. You've got hundreds of startups that are starting here. You just spoke with the folks from Pioneer Square Labs. It's interesting, in talking to Rebecca Lynn, a venture capitalist yesterday, uh, she talked about how she thinks that uh, folks in the Seattle tech scene may be even more loyal to their companies than they are potentially in Silicon Valley because, you know, a lot of talent is actually coming from Silicon Valley to Seattle because there are fewer options, but that loyalty can obviously really pay off when it comes to uh, company productivity. Uh, take a listen to the conversations we've been having with some of these folks up here, listen up. Seattle, of course, is uh, one of uh, the major tech hubs in the world. It uh, boasts uh, uh, about 100,000 uh, experts in IT and cloud computing. The startup scene continues to evolve here. I think it's always been strong, but when you, uh, when you go around Seattle, you just see the amazing number of new companies that have come up. I think Seattle is sort of, as we like to joke, the cloud capital of the world. It's definitely cloudy in the weather. <laughs> Uh, but it really, between Amazon and Microsoft and all of these other companies, uh, you're going to find an incredibly fervent engineering environment with lots of creativity. And by the way, the clouds have been fairly clear while we've been here, so we've very much enjoyed the weather, Corey, as well. Uh, yeah, I, there's nothing better than a beautiful day in Seattle. I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, Emily Chang, great stuff uh, all week. I really appreciate that. Emily Chang from Bloomberg, thanks. Are coming up Zillow dabbling in 3D technology. That's right, Zillow. We're going to take you once again to the GeekWire Summit in Seattle next. This is Bloomberg. Rich people are avoiding investments in Bitcoin. That's according to UBS CEO Sergio Ermati. He told Bloomberg that high net worth investors are curious, but still too skeptical to invest in cryptocurrency. Now moving to real estate, online listings just got a bit more three-dimensional. In an exclusive interview, our own Emily Chang spoke with Zillow CEO Spencer Raskoff at the GeekWire Summit in Seattle. He described the state of real estate and this new 3D feature offered to consumers. 
What we're doing is we're allowing a listing agent or a home seller to take 3D panoramic style photos with a regular smartphone, no dedicated hardware required, and that allows a, a home buyer to get a full perspective of the home where you feel like you're in it. We're testing this in just one city for now. In 2018, we'll roll out it nationwide. But for us, it's all about providing these tools at scale so people can do a better job of trying to imagine what that life would be like in that home. And you're adding new data, real-time consumer insights on rentals. Yeah, so we have a very large rentals business, uh -huh. and what we done is we've taken all this incredible data that we have and we've packaged it up for our multi-family par multi partners. So the people that operate uh, 20,000 uh, know, types of buildings, they now have information on what types of buildings are people looking at, what rents are being paid, you know, what's the demographic, psychographic information of these renters, and they can make decisions about their asset management portfolio, their pricing strategies, their branding of these buildings. And it's another way that we're taking this data and empowering people, in this case, professionals, with the information. How does this add to your bottom line? Uh, well, in that particular case, we're giving that data for free to these building managers. We sell advertising to them, but we think becoming a bigger part of their business strategy is a better way to eventually sell them advertising. Um, in the case of the first innovation of allowing 3D photography, yeah. that's all about providing more differentiated content on the site, generates more traffic and more audience, and then, of course, we sell more advertising. Okay, let's talk about housing prices. When you look across the country, where do you see signs of strength and signs of weakness? Well, the whole country is doing really, really well in housing. So right now, home values are up about 7% year over year, which is very high. Mm. More than half of the country, think about this, more than half the country now is back above peak value. Mm. So one out of two viewers' homes mm. are worth more than their home was worth at the top of the last bubble. Huh. Now, don't worry though, uh, we don't think that this is a bubble. The last bubble was built on a foundation of sand, which was easy credit. Mm. This housing boom is built on just a supply-demand mismatch. Hmm. So there are just not enough homes because what happened is going through the recession, home builders were building many, many fewer homes. And so we have a couple year deficit of a couple million missing homes that just don't exist in the housing stock. And of course, you remember from Econ 101, you know, good demand, not enough supply, home values go up. Here in Seattle, this is the hottest housing market in the country. Home values here are appreciating 12% year over year. Hotter than San Francisco? Hotter than San Francisco. It's a really strong local economy, limited supply, a relatively anti-development um, uh, uh, environment where it's mm -hmm. difficult to build new housing, and that's driven prices up. Is it, a pos is it possible there's an isolated bubble in Seattle, in a San Francisco, in some of these coastal cities where you are seeing these run-ups? Well, I, I mean, when we hesitate to call it a bubble because um, it's built, it, 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 the appreciation is has a, a foundation that uh -huh. supports it. It's just limited supply. Uh, so, uh, of course, it's unsustainable in the sense that home values in Seattle can't go up 12% year over year forever, uh, but it's it's not a bubble because it's actually, it has market fundamentals. Okay, so when it. does the slowdown happen? We, Maybe that's nationwide, the we see home values at 7% year over year yeah. right now, and we're forecasting 4 to 5% next yeah. 12 months. So it is a slowing in that rate of appreciation, but it's certainly not a decline. Are you seeing any impact to prices as a result of the hurricanes in Texas, in Florida? Uh, in the near term, absolutely, but what ends up happening in these natural disasters is incredibly, housing is very resilient. We saw it in, in the case of Sandy and Katrina and, and catastrophe after catastrophe, where with typically within a year or two, home values bounce back to where they were before the catastrophe. How important are first-time home buyers very to this important, market? Very important, very um, important. Uh, I think it's uh, somewhere between a third and a half of all transactions now are going to first-time mm -hmm. home buyers. Uh, um, millennials, just for example, have bought 500 billion of real estate last 12 months. So millennials and first-time buyers are representing a huge portion of the market, and increasingly they're finding ways to get creative. Because of this limited supply that we've been discussing, they have to do things like uh, make multiple offers, dual track, look at renting versus buying at the same time, uh, try to get pre-approved, anything to get their offer to be accepted. A lot of political uncertainty right now. Do you expect that any of that will trickle down to the real estate market? Hasn't impacted housing so far. Of course, eventually as mortgage rates start to tick up, uh, you know, that will make housing slightly less affordable, but so far we haven't seen it impact housing. Well, that was Zillow CEO Spencer Raskoff speaking with Bloomberg's Emily Chang. Coming up, last year Alibaba spent $17 billion in product development. If the company is jacking up its R&D spending to keep up the rivals like Amazon and Tencent, we'll explore next. This is Bloomberg. All right, check this out. Kids getting an allowance on Amazon. Amazon has a new offering targeting teenagers. 
allowing them to shop or stream content and stay within spending limits. If a kid wants to spend more, will it require parental approval offered via a text message? And if the parents are Prime members, teens will also have access to the same benefits, such as two-day free shipping and every teenage boy's favorite, gaming on Amazon-owned Twitch. Well, Alibaba will more than double R&D spending to $15 billion by the end of the decade. That's from $2.5 billion last year. Uh, the plans to develop next-generation tech to drive businesses and some moonshots, keeping up with Google and the like. Alibaba is set to open up seven research labs and hire 100 scientists around the world exploring things like artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things, and quantum computing, no less. Joining me right now to discuss more, Bloomberg Technologies' Selena Wang. Selena, always a pleasure. Um, Alibaba is so interesting, uh, and their their ambitions uh, seem as massive as China. Alibaba is always trying to set precedences, and this time, this is the first time they're extending outside of their own in-house 25 thousand R&D staff to reach around the globe and parts reaching every corner of the world to find the cream of the crop. They want to beat tech giants like Amazon and Microsoft and say, hey, China also can be at the forefront of new frontier technology. And Jack Ma, like many tech luminaries in the U.S., believe that AI is going to drive the future of many industries from manufacturing to e-commerce and the likes. And Alibaba's goal is to reach more than uh, 2 billion customers, create 100 million jobs over the next few decades. And they believe that creating this research institution and doubling down in R&D will help them get there. How are they going to find AI scientists who want to work for Alibaba, the scientists that haven't gotten jobs at Google and haven't gotten jobs at Amazon and haven't gotten jobs at Apple and aren't already working for Uber and aren't right. working for Tesla and everyone else and IBM and everyone else is hiring an AI? And that's a fantastic point. And as we all know, getting I should have tech added tech Oracle and Salesforce and everybody, you know, it's, it's never ending. Getting tech talent is notoriously difficult and that's why they're looking all over the world. They're not just looking at Silicon Valley. They're not just looking in the U.S. They're looking all across Asia, in the Middle East, and they have partnerships with leading institutions like Harvard and Princeton. They've already signed on some uh, researchers to be part of their advisory board. So this definitely isn't going to be easy, but with $15 billion, I mean, that's a lot of money for them to be able to target uh, top tech talent. And this is a really prime time for them to do it as well because they are now an enormous company. Market cap is north of $400 billion. And yesterday, it briefly actually passed Amazon's market cap, and it's highly profitable. So they have the money to spend on this. Um, as, as they spend this money, I mean, it's interesting interesting too that when it comes to AI, it's one of those things that you can't sort of plug and play. You can't go buy it somewhere and, and add it. If Amazon creates a service uh, using AI, it's an Amazon-only service. It's not like somebody they can go out and buy this off-the-shelf software from mm -hmm. somebody else. Right, and Alibaba is recognizing that they want to build this global infrastructure, not only in e-commerce, but also in all of their other ambitions from, you know, they already have investments in self-driving cars. Uh, their cloud computing business is, is growing exceedingly fast. Um, but I think it's also important to put this into perspective. Now, $15 billion, that's a lot of money. But if you compare that to how much Amazon has spent in this area, it's actually just a small fraction. Last year alone, Amazon spent more than $16 billion in this R&D area. And if we look at it in the context of Alibaba spending, uh, if we take a look at a graph in the Bloomberg Terminal, you'll see that it's been about 10% of uh, relative to sales for the past several years. So this isn't actually that unusual so for the expectation Alibaba. Of those, so so their growth rate, in, uh, so th this shows how it compares to other companies compared to Facebook spending 21% of sales uh, in recent years, although that number has been kind of all over the place for Facebook. Um, but it's, it's interesting on, on a quarter to quarter basis. But uh, is the notion Alibaba's just got to keep up with their revenues being so high? Uh, definitely. I mean, Alibaba needs to stay ahead of the game. I mean, the U.S. tech giants like Amazon and Google have traditionally been the leaders in artificial intelligence. And in order to stay up ahead of that, not only with domestic competitors like Baidu and Tencent, but also Amazon, they need to keep on spending. And relative to sales, this is in line with that because their revenue is supposed to about more than double at next year compared to the Do last. Do you think that might suck away from the free cash flow? I mean, uh, they've reported free cash flow for $9 billion last year. Well, investors certainly don't care their stock price just keeps on inching higher and higher and I think that investors are very bullish on their investments in AI because this is an area like you right. said before you can't just piggyback off of other companies they need to have their own in-house research and make sure that they have their own uh, technology in this area finally do we is there any sort of particular product area we think this might uh, show up in is there some product that they think needs some AI to make it special or needs some quantum
some computing to make it special, or is it just they want to know what's going on in technology so that they can throw that into the mix? I think part of it is beefing up their core competencies and making them much smoother and easier to function. For instance, in e-commerce and logistics, that requires a huge amount of infrastructure to be able to uh, have the system move smoothly and to have so much data flowing in and out of out of their networks. We also know that they're already investing in uh, driverless cars. They have their own sort of echo-like device, so of course machine learning is going to be important. And this all, let's not forget, fits into the Chinese government's bigger goals of being the leaders in AI. So what Alibaba is doing is looked very favorably by Beijing. Everything but the kitchen sink. Thank you very much, <laughs> Linda Wang. Always a pleasure. All right, appreciate your time. Well, that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. A reminder, we're live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Bloomberg Tech TV is the handle. Every weekday at 5 o'clock on the East Coast, 2 o'clock on the West Coast. That's all for now. This is Bloomberg.